Welcome everyone. It looks like we already have quite a few people logging in. I'm gonna take just a, a quick moment to ask everyone to open up their chat box and change their drop down in the two from host and panelists to everyone. And we would love to hear where you're joining us from that everyone is going to help us hear where you're joining from. Welcome, Virginia, Iowa, Kansas, all over, wonderful. Well, my name is Meredith Burks and I am Seed Saver Exchange's new marketing and communications director. And I wanna thank everyone. It looks like we have already hit capacity on our 500 person webinar, so that is very exciting. Uh, we all really love the enthusiasm for this topic. Uh, this is the first part of our Welcoming Seeds Home four-part series. And I'm going to just do a couple of housekeeping things and hand it off to the people that you're actually here to listen to. So we have one hour together. It is going to go by quickly. So we are not going to be taking questions from the audience at the end, but we do have some great questions prepared. Please, again, feel free to use the chat to share ideas, comments throughout the presentation. At the end, we are going to be sharing ways that you can contact our featured partners. Of course, you can always reach out to Seed Savers Exchange if you have questions or would like to uh, connect with somebody directly. We are recording, so this is going to be sent out via email later today, probably a few hours after our session ends. And with that, I'm just gonna quickly hand it off to Phil Kauf, who is our Director of Preservation at Seed Savers Exchange. So Phil, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thanks, Meredith. Um, appreciate it. Uh, I'm pretty stoked uh, we have this many people for the, this this webinar. Um, I would I told people when we first started uh, advertising, I would have been really thrilled with 100 to 200. To, so to see the uh, the response has been incredible. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to have a little bit of context before I, I hand it off. Um, so Seed Savers Exchange uh, was invited in 2017 um, to participate in the uh, Indigenous Seed Keepers Network uh, rematriation project. Um, that was uh, invited by um, Rowan White, who is our board chair uh, at Seed Savers Exchange and, and the founder of the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network, uh, which is now part of uh, the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And so the first couple of years, we, we exclusively grew on the farm here uh, with, with guidance from Rowan. And then the third year and the fourth year, uh, Rowan really suggested we uh, reach out and, and find um, indigenous farmers to, to uh, participate. And we submitted a grant to North Central SARE, so Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. And they funded a partnership grant last year. Um, and unfortunately, COVID hit, and we we were going to do a, a lot of in-person field days. Um, but instead, uh, we shot a video, which is up on our YouTube website. So I highly recommend you check that out. And then this year, um, we submitted a second grant, and we went from three partners to eight, and we. Um, I've been so grateful to Sarah for, for all of this. Um, so with that, um, I am gonna turn it over to my good friend, Shelly Buffalo. Um, Shelly is an enrolled member of the Meskwaki tribe and lives on the Meskwaki settlement uh, with her two sons. The Meskwaki are unique in that their land-based community is a settlement, not a reservation. Established in 1857 with the purchase of 80 acres near Tama, Iowa, the Meskwaki settlement has grown to approximately 8,400 acres. Shelley joined Seed Savers Exchange for the 2021 growing season as a seasonal seed steward, which was awesome. Uh, she now works for a sustainable Iowa land trust, uh, SILT, through the AmeriCorps VISTA program. And her service assignment with SILT is to build capacity in farmer outreach in order to increase land access for socially disadvantaged farmers. Shelley served her community recently in a coordinator role at 
Red Earth Gardens and with the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiative. And she continues to advocate for food sovereignty, local foods through her personal consultancy networks and partnerships. She is an advocate for land back, indigenous foodways, food justice, and rematriation. So I'm going to hand it off to Shelly, uh, my good friend, and she's a great mentor. Um, so take it away, Shelly. Thank you, Phil. Now, um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, but we're, we are here to highlight um, Dr. Rebecca Webster and Kelly Zahn. And um, I'm going to start um, with Dr. Webster's bio. Um, she is an enrolled citizen of the Oneida Nation and an assistant professor in the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Her research interests focus on tribal governance and food sovereignty. Her philosophy is that every time an indigenous person plants a seed, that is an act of resistance, an assertion of sovereignty and a reclamation of identity. With this in mind, an Oneida, an Oneida faith keeper named the Webster family's 10 acre homestead, Unguakwa. And um, there's, there's a longer word that um, Becky is going to pronounce for us, but the meaning um, of the farm's name is our foods where we plant things. To share their farming practices, they started a YouTube channel, Unguakwa, our foods, focused on planting, growing, harvesting, seed keeping, food preparation, and food storage, as well as making traditional tools and crafts. In 2021, the family formed a nonprofit organization, Nguakwa Incorporated, to advance their goals of helping share knowledge. Um, and the, the um, links will be shared um, as part of this uh, webinar um, to the YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, and um, as well as contact information. Um, our other partner is Kelly Zahn, and she is the agriculture agent at the Stockbridge Muncie community located in Bowler, Wisconsin, where she manages four community gardens totaling over two acres of growing space. The tribe started the agriculture department in 2016, and Kelly has served as the agriculture agent since that time. Kelly earned a degree in agricultural business from the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, and is a certified crop advisor. From the Earth started as a half acre learning garden where com community members can come to learn sustainable ways to grow food. They provide food to the Stockbridge Muncie community and surrounding area. The goal of the program is to improve community nutrition by making fresh produce available to community members. And there's also links um, to Facebook and YouTube, as well as Kelly's contact information that's included in this webinar um, handout. So with the introductions done, I think we're gonna start with Becky, who has a slide presentation um, about her farm and her operation and all of her endeavors. So we're ready for you. All right, so Goli Swagwake, Kanyete Gay Lu Nyungets and Guehuene, Becky Webster Nyungets O Slunige, Maguahoni Wigit Talod, Onyote Aga, Nyugit Homan Jot, Dulunkawane, Nitwagenu. So greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Kanyete Gay, which means snow scattered here and there. My English name is Becky Webster. I'm Wolf Clan, I'm Oneida, and I grew up near Duck Creek that runs through the Oneida Reservation. I'm really excited to be here today, especially being in such good company of folks who have a love and a passion for our seeds. Um, in our background right here, that's one of our three sisters gardens that we have here on our farmstead. And this is from last summer. Um, I'm relatively new to growing and caring for our seeds. So I just wanna share really quick a bit about our latest adventures and how we all started. Next slide. So this first one on the left here, that is, we were so very proud. That was our entire white corn harvest in 2015, which feels like so long ago, but yet just yesterday, all at the same time. And on the right-hand side is our harvest from just this past summer, where we've expanded to lots of varieties of indigenous and Haudenosaunee varieties of corn, beans, squash, we have tobacco and sunflowers. 
And um, just, we're having a really good time here, but it took a bit to get to this point within that time frame. Next slide. So in 2017, we purchased 10 acres of land um, on the other side of the reservation where we had been growing. And this 10 acres was, um, had, a, had some issues with it. So this back portion on the left-hand side over there, that was actually a former paintball field. There were over 10 rotten wooden structures, 10 giant plastic barrels, and over 2,000 tires on that property that we had to remove when we purchased it. And that front acreage had been conventionally cropped, really terrible soil. We had some soil tests and um, the soil was really damaged. And there was a drainage area that later we would turn into um, a, a pond. So that was, that was what we had to start with. And in just these few years, um, we've been able to work to help repair the soil. If you wanna to go to the next slide and just do a whole lot of things here on the property to heal it. So here's the full name of our farmstead. It's Ungwakwa Jitnu Niungwaya Toslu. As Shelly mentioned, it means our foods where we plant things. So when we talked to our, one of our faith keepers here about our ideas for this property, the idea was that it was going to be more than just, you know, a place to share seeds or just to come and learn. It was about planting ideas and philosophies and um, just reclaiming who we are as a people and welcoming these seeds home. That is a huge part of what we wanted to do here because the Oneida people, we are removed from um, the state of New York and we wanted to try to figure out and welcome back those seeds that we had historically grown before we were removed here and to create a safe place for those seeds again and have our families grow them again. And we've been having a really fun time being able to do that. Next slide. <clears throat> so here's what we did. We, we worked with the USDA to get a couple of grants to help us along. And some of those grants were, we had a one acre pollinator habitat four acres of tree planting that really surrounded our property, and then a 30 by 90 high tunnel, which was a whole new adventure in itself. And we ended up growing some three sisters in there to be able to extend the season out. Um, a month earlier, we were able to plant in there according to the moon cycles. But also we were able to plant more varieties of corn too, um, and save those seeds because we didn't have to worry about cross-pollination because we were able to plant that whole entire month earlier. So with all of this help from the um, USDA, uh, we were able to really start to shape our property. Next slide. So, and then comes Seed Savers Exchange, this rematriation effort. We were so excited for this opportunity because um, so what happened is Phil sent over a spreadsheet that said, um, here's some, some seeds that we have that you might be interested in. And I almost lost my mind when they had a whole entire tab of this spreadsheet dedicated to Haudenosaunee seeds. I was overwhelmed. I got a little carried away that first year. You can see I, I chose seven varieties of beans to welcome home here, a couple squash and then some tobacco. And then the following year, I simmered down on the beans just a little bit. We got some corn, squash, and then some sunchokes. So we were able to grow all of these here. And because we had so many beans and um, our affinity for beans, we we're able to share even more of those with our community. Next slide. And we created a, an informal bean co-op. So this is just a loose uh, network of people, mostly from our community here, who wanted to grow out Haudenosaunee varieties of these beans. And another part of it is that no one person should have to be responsible for all of these varieties of beans. So we um, handed out the seeds to the different people in the community and we're growing them out. And then the idea is that we'll be able to share them and keep them alive um, with, the, with each other. So um, the word, and I'm still practicing this was Jung was a, Jung was a heidos, uh, Jung was a heidosos, and that means we are selecting beans. So we're really excited this coming spring to even be able to further network and share with each other to nurture and care for these beans. Next slide. And here's a quick video. It's an aerial of um, our farmstead. That's the high tunnel where we had some um, corn, beans, and squash. Uh, we had some 
tomatoes in there. We had some cherry tomatoes and some strawberries. And here we're overlooking the pollinator habitat and there's some tree plantings back there. We're gonna come and check out the pond. One side of the pond is 25 feet deep. So we're hoping to be able to have some fish in there. These are our three sisters gardens and the rest is pretty much beans. And right there, that slab is the future spot of our kitchen, which we just finished a few weeks ago. So that's what our farmstead looks like now. So it's come, you can go ahead to the next slide. It's come quite a ways since we first purchased it. And here's the farmstead kitchen on the left there. That's our, our new uh, building that we have for our, um, the reason that we created this is we wanted to have another opportunity for our community members to process our indigenous foods. And I think the more opportunities like this that are out there, the better for our whole community. So we've um, just finished up, like I mentioned, within a matter of weeks ago, and we've already processed um, about 40 pounds of corn in there so far, oh, no, 60 pounds of corn. And we're hoping to get in there and, and process some more. And we did have a lot of help with grants also for this thing. We had um, two grants from the Kindle Project, and we had one grant from the First Nations Development Institute to be able to help us with this kitchen project. And next slide. Like Shelly mentioned, this is our philosophy here at our farmstead, is that every time an indigenous person plants a seed, that is an act of resistance, an assertion of sovereignty, and a reclamation of identity, and rematriating these seeds back to us so that we can grow and care for them and then turn around and, and give them to our community is a huge step in being able to make this happen. Yama. I think you're on mute, Shelly. I always forget that. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Um, it's really wonderful to see how much your farm has grown. Um, I, I was able to visit uh, Becky's farm in 2020 in October at the end of the growing season. And um, yeah, I just, uh, I hope I get another chance to visit soon uh, to see the, the um, community kitchen that's gone up and all the other incredible improvements. Um, so next we're going to um, see a presentation from Kelly. Um, Kelly, are you ready? Yep, I'm good to go. Um, thank you all so much for uh, joining us today and letting me just share a little bit more about our experience here. Um, so I work for the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians, which is a Native American tribe located in, um, I'll call it North central-ish Wisconsin. So just going to be talking a little bit more about uh, our farm, kind of how we got started, and then also um, the work that we've been doing to reconnect with some of our seeds. So you can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so the tribe um, in 2015 redid a strategic plan or updated a strategic plan. And one of the goals that they had on this as part of the strategic plan was to work on building food sovereignty within the community. Um, so that's really sort of where the tribe's uh, agriculture department started and really where I guess I got my introduction here. So in the time since then, we've kind of been doing this slow build on working with the community, getting to, for me, been getting to know and understand maybe some of the needs and wants that are happening for the with the community, and then also working on ways to bring food resources here. So next slide, please. So on our strategic plan, we talked about building food sovereignty. And a big part of what that was for us was really defining what that, what that means. Um, I think when people talk about food sovereignty, it can mean, the cool thing about it is that it can mean different things to different people. So for us, we really define that as helping the community's food supply become more self-sufficient. Um, it, it is a broad sort of definition on purpose, but uh, we really look at doing that in two ways. So the first way is through hands-on education with community members about growing and preserving food. So it's really my goal uh, 
around COVID, I should say, uh, to have, you know, between 15 to 20 different kinds of educational classes each year, usually during the growing season, um, getting people out, connecting about their food, and then also connecting with how to preserve it, uh, since we do have such a long winter here in Wisconsin. And then the second way we are looking at building food sovereignty within the community was really starting a tribal farm um, and using this as a resource to bring local foods to the community. Um, we are located in the middle of a food desert. So that is a space, uh, I, think, I think by definition, you have to travel uh, between 10 to 20 miles to get to the nearest grocery store. And that's definitely where we are living here in Wisconsin. Um, so working on bringing some of those food resources to the community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so about um, four years ago, we really just started work on making it happen. So when I started working for the tribe, I said, hey, um, we have some land set aside for you, uh, just agricultural land that the tribe had been renting out to a local farmer. So we decided to take about a half acre out of um, what was, you know, a conventional corn soybean rotation and really use that as home base for our farm. And over the past four years have really just been kind of doing this slow build, um, taking advantage of some more infrastructure. Similarly to what Becky said, the USDA has been a huge help um, providing us with some funding to put up a high tunnel. We put up another high tunnel this year. Um, also with work from partners from First Nations Development Institute, the Native American Agriculture Fund, and SARE. Um, we've all been able to partner with grants to help build some more infrastructure and build some educational resources at the farm. Next slide, please. So we are um, a fully functioning farm sort of outside of our educational event. This year alone, we harvested uh, just over 9,000 pounds of produce. This is a number that has continued to grow. Um, I think we did about 5,000 pounds last year. So this year we were able to go uh, have another expansion and are really just taking the lessons that we learn from one growing season to the next um, and working on making sure that you know we are doing the best methods for our crops and just taking those lessons and applying them to the next year. Next slide, please. So um, when we first started our farm, we were really, I would say mainly focused on what I'll call regular uh, vegetables. Um, but over the past two years, we've really been working on trying to reconnect with some of these traditional foods um, with a big thanks to Seed Savers for helping connect us with a number of these varieties. Um, we were also doing some work with somebody from UW-Madison who uh, helped us find some more, some more food resources. So the tribe that I work for was um, originally settled out in New York East Coast area. And sort of as they got pushed further west and over time, uh, a lot of that history and those seeds were really lost along the way. Um, there, at least it's been my experience, you know, there, there wasn't some secret stash of these hanging out in the community somewhere. Um, so it has really been a journey with working with different community members and people who are just really passionate about um, tracking down some of these seeds and bringing them back home uh, and working on getting them back here and growing them. Next slide, please. So this summer, um, we've just slowly been starting to do this. So we are growing, I think, two different varieties of corn, again, six or seven different varieties of beans, and then we have a couple of different varieties of squash. So we have a couple of gardens spaced out around the community. Um, this part, this raised row area was a part that we, we did a big farm expansion this year. And so now we are growing in this space. Uh, and it was really fun to be able to build. It was like a multi-generational. We had um, an elder, some youth out there working on building these rows and these mounds and putting them together. So we really try to make this a community space um, to have people come out and help plant and help take care of this. And there are just some pictures here of, of what's happening throughout the growing season. Next slide. So we've also learned quite a few lessons along the way. Uh, the picture that we have on here is of the corn, well, of our high tunnel and some of the corn that is growing in there. So 
we started growing this Lenape white corn. The first time we grew it was two years ago. And granted, it got planted, I think it was like the beginning of June, just with COVID and shutdowns and how everything was happening. Um, we had, you know, planted this corn directly from seed outside and it didn't reach maturity. So it's always my philosophy. I like to give things a couple of shots before we just chuck them out. Um, and I actually got this idea from Becky. So thank you for that. When she mentioned that she was growing corn in her high tunnel and I was like, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. Um, so that's what we did. And so we started um, a couple of flats of these seeds and planted a hundred of them in our in one of our high tunnels and then planted some other ones outside and we're actually able to have a successful white horn white corn harvest from them this year um, but we were also trying to make it still feel like a three sisters garden so in between our corn we had beans growing we had some squash and cucumbers um, there was there were a lot of things going on in the high tunnel but it was just awesome to be able to kind of see all of these plants grow together next slide so this is just a little more in-depth look at the corn and how we were growing it. So in our high tunnel, uh, we were utilizing landscape fabric as a way to sort of help with some weed prevention. And then we had some drip irrigation that was under the landscape fabric. So we could kind of, uh, you know, control the water and make sure that we were sort of creating this perfect growing environment. Um, but these are just, you can see there are beans, our Muncie beans our stock bridge beans, sorry, are growing along the bottom um, and just a kind of a way that we were able to uh, take these plants throughout the season. It was really, it was really cool to watch these plants grow. Um, these varieties are really new to us. So every year is a learning experience and we just learn a little bit more about these crops each season. Next slide. So this is another one of the beans that we were able to get thanks to Seed Savers Exchange, our, um, our Muncie beans, and just wanted to share, I guess, a little bit about kind of how we are growing with our pole beans. So one of, I think, the coolest things about this bean is that, you know, I think we got them in maybe 100 or 60 seeds from Seed Savers, and we're able to take those seeds and now plant them out this year and had an entire row. So it was really fun to be able to watch them grow again, learn a little bit more about these. Um, we're not doing anything super fancy, stick a couple of fence posts in the ground, and then we have some plastic netting um, that we use to uh, stake them up. They could, these beans tend to be quite heavy and um, could use something more stable, I would say, but it has been a good method of growing for us and just a way to get some of these plants off of the ground. Next slide. So a lot of what we are doing is uh, just really some building some awareness and building some excitement within the community. This was one of my favorite pictures from this growing season. Um, so in here are Warren and Joanna. They are actually a brother sister team, um, but we're two of my employees from this summer and were fantastic to have. Um, Warren has such a passion and a knowledge for traditional foods. So when he, he started um, working for me partway through the season and he came out and saw this white corn, which is like 12 feet tall. It was so fun to watch it through his eyes was he was like, wow, this is so cool. And so for me, hearing that from Warren is like the highest praise I could tell you. Um, and then Joanna was really uh, instrumental in sort of designing some of our gardens and caring for them. And they were just great advocates in the community um, to bring people out and sort of spread the word. And now this year, now that we were in year two, we were able to start doing a little bit more cooking with some of these plants, um, which has been, which has been really, really fun and so grateful to have uh, both of these guys on staff and just continue to share our seed story. Next slide, please. So each year, like I said, we like to have different community events. So whether that's inviting people out to sort of, hey, come help uh, weed, take care, love, talk nicely to these plants. We really like to create a space in the garden um, that can be, that's, that's more than just a garden, right? That it, it is truly a spot for a community 
and for people to grow and heal and be together. And that has just been so awesome to be able to do. We also had a couple of classes, you know, about uh, braiding corn, which was something that I had no idea how to do. So Warren came in and led it for us. And then also just doing other seed saving classes, things like that, just raising awareness um, about what we can do to care for some of these seeds. Next slide. So for me, um, I am, I'm not a tribal member. I, you know, started, I started working for the tribe five years ago. I do have sort of my own history and connection to agriculture, but I would say, especially for me, being able to work with these indigenous plants and bringing them back to the community has really changed the way that I look at food. Um, and especially the way that we're looking at and protecting these seeds, I can still, it's, it's one of those moments that just sticks with me. Um, we planted our stock bridge beans for the first time and I had no idea, we had no idea what to do with them, right? So we picked a couple and brought some back to uh, some of them. I work in the same office with a couple of ladies who are elders and shared them, said, hey, you know, let me know what you think these beans maybe don't look the same, maybe don't taste the same, but let me know what you think. And one of the ladies, Tony, she took a bite um, of this bean and she almost started to cry. And I was like, what, what is happening? And she said, you have no idea what this means to me. This is a connection to my history. And for me, that took me back because I didn't even realize that, I mean, it, it sounds bad saying it now, but I didn't even realize that food could have that sort of connection or impact. Um, and, but honestly, it was one of the most beautiful moments that I've had while working here. And really, I think just goes to show the importance of protecting these seeds and making sure that they get back to the people who, who need them the most. So next slide. And really, as I look forward, it's definitely one of my goals to make sure that everybody in the community has access to these traditional foods. Um, so we're working on setting up a seed bank. So if people want to grow them themselves, they can't. I realize that, you know, maybe not everybody has a green thumb, but also has access to be able to incorporate them into their diet on a regular basis is awesome. Um, and something that we are definitely looking forward to. The picture here was from uh, we had a harvest feast and it was some of our blue beans and our blue corn we ground up into flour and made cupcakes with. Um, so it was just, it was so awesome to be able to share when we were having our feast that, hey, these are, this is from, you know, our traditional seeds and uh, just really hope to be able to continue to do that for the future. So next slide. I think that's it for me. <laughs> I can't get my pointer fast enough there to unmute. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, that was awesome. I did um, just, uh, and I think that another great thing, like, you know, I'm aware that you're not a tribal member. Um, at the same time, it's like being in the program for five years uh, really does help to develop that continuity um, with the not just um, continuity of the program, but also, you know, with the people mm -hmm. and, and to really, you know, serve their needs well. So thank you for the work that you're doing and for your wonderful presentation. Um, before we launch into our questions for the both of you, I did notice in the chat that somebody had mentioned um, how, what they know of three sisters planting and that, um, their um, understanding of it is that you plant the corn and beans and squash together with the beans trailing up the corn plants. Um, I just wanted to comment on that real quickly. Um, so, um, so our tribal nations are really diverse. And so the, the way that we plant our seeds are equally as di diverse. I think like um, Kelly showed some raised beds um, both Kelly and Becky showed, you know, their current methodologies with the high tunnels um, in order to control their environment. Um, so now, you know, we use some contemporary methods as well as incorporating some traditional methods. Um, I'm from the Meskwaki tribe and we grow the three sisters. We, we grow our corn, beans, and squash. 
but we don't grow them um, as three sisters, if that makes any sense to you. Um, we don't, you know, we, you know, they're in separate plots within our garden. And, um, and so that's just, that's just how we do it. So it's the, the methodologies are as varied as the languages and, um, and, you know, the, the different societies and cultures um, across Turtle Island. Um, so let's get to our questions. Um, I'm going to throw these out here to you too. And just um, either of you jump in when a response comes to mind. Um, we'll start with uh, rematriation. Uh, rematriation may be new terminology to some of our listeners. Becky and Kelly, what does rematriation mean to you and how has it touched your lives? I can go ahead. So um, for me, rematriation is welcoming our seeds home. Um, as Kelly mentioned, um, Oneida and Stockbridge are, were both from out east. We were removed. We um, felt like so many other tribal communities, the effects of colonization, assimilation, and removal. And um, we, we have a pretty, a pretty rough past that we have a lot of healing to do from that. And I think rematriation of our seeds is one of those ways that, that we're healing because we were separated um, from our children, from the boarding schools. We were separated from our language. We were separated from our land. We were separated from our seeds. So I think all this, bringing this all back together is helping us so that the next generations can, can, um, can be reunited with, with those plant relatives. And for me, um, I'm just really excited to be able to be a part of that. Um, somebody asked if it's a scary responsibility and I never thought of it as that, or, or if it's a burden, I never thought of it as that. I just was so happy to be able to be in a position to have this place where we can welcome the, welcome the seeds home, where we can care for them, where we can grow them out, and then we can turn around and help our other community members grow them out too. So it's about reestablishing those relationships with those long lost relatives. And even though um, it wasn't our people who had been caring for them, it was Seed Savers Exchange. I think that is an amazing partnership to recognize that while we weren't able to care for our seeds, somebody else was, and they kept good track and amazing records of all of the seeds that they gathered and where they got them from, and that they were able to share that with us when they returned those seeds home to us. Yeah, definitely. Um, Becky, I think, I, I don't know what else there is to say after, after what you just shared, but for me, it really means um, being, able to, being able to reconnect these seeds with the community. I think it is such a gift to be able to do it. And I personally, I do feel like it is a scary responsibility, um, but one that I am so honored to be able to do um, because like I said, I never, I didn't realize how much of an important connection that these seeds could be to somebody's past or um, just from talking to different people and their experiences out in the garden, how, how healing that can be and how much of truly a sacred space um, that bringing these plants back, back home can connect uh, with people. And it is, it's awesome to be able to do that. And again, also so grateful that somebody was able to take care of them until we found, until we found our way back to each other. So. Thank you. Um, during the 2020 growing season, which was challenging on many levels for me personally, I found the Seed Rematriation Partnership to be supportive for the knowledge shared as well as the camaraderie. What support system did you have in place or found along the way that helped you? Yeah, this is um, for me something that has been a huge, huge part of what we do because I often am like, this isn't, this isn't me, you know, this is, this is somebody else. So for me, it was being able to connect with some of my employees like Warren, oh my gosh, that guy is an amazing resource, an amazing, just 
amount of information that he holds and stories that he can share um, that it's awesome to be able to connect with people like that. And, but also just being able to have those community days when people are out in the garden and they're just, you know, they're having fun, they're laughing, they're joking. Um, that's to me where, where community, where community happens. And for me, it really makes it feel like on all of those long days, or, you know, if you're wondering if these plants are going to turn out the way they should, I mean, it's, it can be, it can be hard. It can be, um, emotionally exhausting, I think sometimes, uh, but it's awesome to be able to have a network and sort of community here of people who are really passionate about doing this too and and want to sort of share in the seed story and help it help it grow to the next generation. And for me, I, I was really lucky to have a huge network of people to lean on and rely on. Um, a number of people from our own community here um, have been growing our foods, but there weren't a whole lot here. So we had started to go out east um, and meet with some seed mentors out there, just connected to different mentors. The Indigenous Seed Keepers Network that Rowan had worked on was, a, it just, it's huge, even just little things because I don't come from an agricultural background. So I was, we were, our family was really starting at square one, even just agriculture, let alone our indigenous relative seeds. So um, there's that, there's the people at Seed Savers Exchange, um, all kinds of questions that I was able to, to spread out to different people. So I wasn't hitting up one person too often about, about our questions. But I think what's been really powerful too is that even though we've only been growing for such a short time, to finally be in a position where people ask me questions about our seeds and I can answer them and I can provide them. And it's, it's really empowering to be able to be at the other end of that instead of always being the one that needs help. So um, we're, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of people to really rely on to, to help us figure this out and take care of our seeds. Yeah, that's, um, and it, it really, this really ties into rematriation um, because this is um, this is the what grows naturally um, when we bring our seeds home, right? Is that we grow community and we strengthen all those relationships. Um, but it does speak to you know um, that history of removal um, and um, and how seed rematriation is bringing us back into relationship with the land. Um, so uh, what challenges and barriers have you experienced and how have you worked through them? Some of our challenges at first were access to the seeds uh, because our community didn't hold a lot of the seeds. Um, we didn't have a lot of our indigenous varieties. We didn't have our own Ida varieties here um, that were known to the community. Um, through these different networks, we've been able to, to get them. Um, other thing was, uh, we again we were new we were new at this we um, bought this property that was conventionally farmed um, or you know used as a paintball field um, even though we wanted to eventually move to a no-till method we had to do something to start and we weren't really in a position to be able to do that by hand um, so we did have to we had to buy a track we refinanced the house to buy a tractor um, we had to we didn't have access to a barn or other equipment like that so or, or a kitchen to process our food on the scale that we wanted to. So again, um, a couple of years later, we refinanced our house again. So a lot of the barriers for us were financial. And um, we recently formed our 501c3 to help with that because we just can't keep pouring everything that, that, um, that we do on a personal level onto this, this property. Um, we just can't keep up at this pace. So we did that with the hopes of being able to you know, create more uh, learning spaces for the community to come and be able to tap into some grants that way. So I'd say the two biggest barriers for us were the seeds themselves and then access to, to capital. Um, I did wanna mention this partnership with Seed Savers Exchange was el extra helpful too, because if, you'll, if you remembered from the flyover of our property, we had a bunch of those um, uh, tunnels. They were trellises that, um, they're cattle panels that are just, um, looped over into, into a tunnel. And you can see one on the screen right now. Seed Savers Exchange helped us purchase the materials for those. They also helped us uh, buy clover seed so that we could 
um, help repair the soil. Um, they helped us get fish uh, emulsion, which is what we had a version of what we traditionally used in our mounds instead of the actual fish. Um, a little bit easier product to use is the fish emulsion. So all of these different things that um, people helped us with, the USDA grants, everything has been um, to be able to help us get moving. So those were some barriers to seeds in the, the financing. Yeah, I would really echo that too. Um, for us, it has been a challenge. I mean, at least for me, a big challenge is tracking down which varieties were actually connected to the community um, is a huge barrier just because that the knowledge about that has been has been lost. And, um, you know, even just talking to elders in the community, they can maybe describe things, but don't don't know the names of them. So that is definitely a challenge. Um, but for me, I would say one of the biggest challenges and something that has really been helpful um, to me through this partnership, I had no experience saving seeds before I started doing this. Um, none. So being able to talk to people who actually know what they're doing and be able to learn and grow together um, has been something that's been really, really helpful for me just because, I mean, I don't know, I feel like I called Phil, at least a couple, I'm like, I have no idea. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, somebody, somebody please help me because I'm like, I don't, I don't want to mess this up. Um, and I want to make sure that we are, you know, keeping our plants separate enough so that way they're not cross pollinating with each other. Um, so a lot of the times that is something that's always going in the back of my mind when we are looking at, you know, how we're growing, where we're growing, what we're doing, things like that, um, to make sure that we can preserve these lines of seeds as we move forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, what strengths and opportunities came up during this partnership? Um, I would say for me, I was just really grateful with the ideas that were shared. Um, like I think I said during my presentation, I was pulling ideas from what Becky was saying. I'm like, yes, sounds good. And I think that is um, so awesome when you're able to come together, even if it's people from, you know, we are geographically located in, you know, very similar conditions. Um, but even when you're talking to people from across the upper Midwest and just gaining their getting their insights into what they're growing and what they're doing has been has been such a gift and honestly so so useful and now as we are you know planning for next year has already planted the seeds of um, what we need to do and and how we can continue this work and continue sort of expanding what we're able to grow for the community and like I said just just that resource of having people to ask those questions to, um, especially when you're starting out is, is so, so valuable. So very appreciative of that. Yeah, I would definitely echo what Kelly just said about um, all of the knowledge and expertise that Seed Savers has, the stories that they have too that um, go along of where they got these seeds from and, and, and whatnot. So one of my seed mentors, Steve McCumber from out East, he was one that gave a lot of these seeds to seed savers. I don't know, is it the eighties or nineties? Um, so I was able to, again, ask him questions to about, about these seeds, but even at our regular, I don't know if it was like our monthly check-ins, it was a good opportunity to just like, Hey, I got a random question for you about sun chokes. Cause I have no idea what I'm doing. So just that th those, you know, connections about, you know, what to expect and, um, how, how, how are things going? Is, is this what it's supposed to look like? You know, those things were, were really helpful, um, to be able to guide us along in that process. Cool. And, um, and I just wanted to mention, um, that Seed Savers Exchange does grow out the ISKN, which is the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. They grow out, um, selected ISKN seeds, um, every growing season, right? So, um, that um, kind of it's that's a continuing relationship as well as um, a knowledge base of um, all of those things about uh, you know even all of the little things about uh, these different plants and how they respond to weather um, soils and all that stuff so it's it's an ongoing process um, so um, to talk a little bit more about rematriation um, and I and I also see, you know, some of the questions that are in the chat also reflect 
curiosity about this in, in respect to um, how can they support rematriation work and be in solidarity with traditional seed keepers. Um, like uh, one of the things that, that we talked about around this topic is that not everyone has rights to everything. So how do we make that known? What about appropriation as well as sensationalism? Um, specifically sensationalism has been used quite a bit in some seed catalogs, right? Um, to sell their product. Um, also, what does culturally appropriate seed distribution, distribution look like? And, um, and to just take note for everybody out there that in popular culture, there is a tendency to entitlement over anything and everything indigenous from appropriation to sensationalism, including seeds. So how is rematriation shifting this paradigm? And what are some actions that you would ask folks to take to promote seed solidarity? That's a pretty big question. <laughs> and I can go back to points. But, um, so I think one of the things that um, I find um, frustrating is that um, when we're looking at the history of our seeds and how they have um, a commercialized name to them, where somebody, you know, probably came onto an Indian reservation or got a hold of our seeds somehow, slapped their name on it and started to sell it in a seed catalog. So it, it kind of disrupts the um, continuity of what's going on with our seeds. I mean, and sure, obviously, obviously indigenous people carried different seeds throughout Indian country, North and South America, and grew them in their communities and put a name on them um, for, 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 for their purposes too. But I think it's a little bit different intention and I see so many Baker Creek seeds. Yeah, so there's a there's different companies out there that have have done this and, and taken them. So one of the things I think is great about Seed Savers Exchange is they try to keep those names or or keep that record of where they came from. And I do have one of the videos on our YouTube channel that talks about Indigenous seed exchange etiquette and how we can have our non-Indigenous allies. Um, who can help us. Um, if you can see behind me, there's, I have some seed corn hanging behind me. One of them is a, is a, a red, a red corn, a Mohawk red flower corn. So I grew that out about three years ago. Um, and, and I shared some seeds with a non-Indigenous friend because I, I just, you can't grow as many varieties of corn as you want, right? So he lives farther away. He grew that out last the year before and he returned some seeds to me. So I was able to grow it a, a whole lot. That's what we grew out on our farmstead. So it was entrusted to a, a one of our allies to be able to help us in this seed, seed uh, growing out our seeds to be able to have them in an abundance instead of just having a small number. So there's so many different aspects to this. Um, so we don't necessarily forbid non-Indigenous people from getting a hold of our seeds, right? Um, we have to have trusted allies. We have to understand that these are our relatives. They're not a commodity. Um, and it's just, if you can go into it with that mindset, then I think that we're one step ahead of where we were before. Thank you. Oh, and um, Becky, while um, Kelly uh, responds to the question, maybe you could throw up the link to that YouTube video in the chat. Sure. Are you able to do that? Yeah. Great. Great. Um, Kelly, uh, seed solidarity actions or comments? <laughs> yeah, so I feel like, I mean, even, even as I think about this question, as somebody who uh, is not Native, it, it, is, it is a really big question. And I mean, often one that, quite honestly, I struggle with. Um, just because, you know, this is, this is, my, this is my job um, to to work here and to and to grow seeds and be a and be a steward of them for the community and then to help share that information in the community and often I don't feel like um, I am worthy of being the person who is sharing that story um, so that is I guess just of, of my own personal thoughts feelings and experiences something that happens but then also um, on the other side when we're looking at it in the community um, I guess when I think about standing in solidarity, to me, that means 
saying, yes, I can be here. What can I do to help? You know, asking, asking the question of the community. That's always something that I try to do um, that say, hey, what community members, what, what do you want more of? What, what would you like to see? What is important to you? And making sure that I am always going back and asking that question um, to make sure that, that we are moving in the right direction and moving in the direction um, that, that the community wants that the community wants to move forward in um, is something that I think is really, really important. And again, similarly to what Becky said, it's not, it's not saying that, hey, we are the Stockbridge Muncie community and we're the only people who can grow these seeds. But I think that it is really important to share the story and the connection and the history that goes along with them. That these aren't seeds that you're, you know, picking from a drop down menu in a catalog. That these, store, these seeds have a story and being willing and able to share that story and as people from outside of the community, listening to it, I think is something that is so, so important. Um, and just, it, like I said, it's, it's so hard. I mean, that one conversation that I had with my coworker about saying how, how important these seeds were as a connection to her past was really a moment that stopped me in my tracks and made me realize um, how much how much bigger right this is and how much bigger these seeds are than just something that you're putting in the ground and I think that anytime um, you know we can take a step back and maybe appreciate somebody else's perspective is so so valuable um, and especially when we're talking about native seeds. Yeah thank you and I think that um, maybe just my reflections on that is that I would encourage people, I understand that people are really excited to learn about um, the indigenous seeds and rematriation, and they wanna be allies in this. Um, so I encourage people to be really mindful of, um, of why this partnership was, um, I guess, uh, necessary, right? Um, and um, why we're doing this rematriation work. It's because of, removal and forced assimilation, you know, these seeds are our relatives. Um, that's, and, um, you know, we had our relatives um, taken away from us, right? And so um, I would encourage people to think instead of, um, you know, thinking about how can we access these amazing seeds, especially, you know, the beautiful, um, pictures that both Becky and uh, Kelly have shared. Um, I understand the excitement, but I encourage people to reflect upon um, instead of immediately thinking about how they can access these seeds, um, maybe thinking about how they can get give back, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, allyship and solidarity work that you can do um, that isn't taking, right? That isn't having that, you know, perceived need to access um, what we've just, so many of us have just recently gotten back into our communities. Um, so we're getting close to the end of the hour. Um, I'm wondering if Phil wanted to come back on and, and um, you know, uh, see us off. Um, and I just want to thank um, both Becky and Kelly for your time and your wonderful perspectives and especially um, what you are doing. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, especially for Shelly for hosting and to Kelly and, and Becky for, for being amazing guests. Um, you know, if, if people are interested in, in, supporting I, I really highly recommend checking out amongst many places uh, Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance is a great um, organization um, but there's a whole host of other places to 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 support as well um, so next week we've got another webinar coming out uh, with Shiloh Maples and Rosebud Bear Schneider uh, and Shelly's going to be right back here again next Tuesday same time one o'clock um, I hope to see you there, everybody. Take care. Anakiwa.